So today we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, and uh, um, that's a shocker, huh? And this is part two of Thanksgiving, and we're looking at 1 Timothy. And Timothy was basically old man Paul writing to his uh, uh, trainee. You know, Paul was Timothy's mentor, and here he's writing encouraging words. By the way, last book of the Bible that we, excuse me, last letter from Paul is 2 Timothy. Uh, and if you, I, I know they're not in that order. Um, Paul's letters are in order of length. I don't know if you knew that. And, and so 2 Timothy follows 1 Timothy, but that was actually Paul's last letter. And so when you read 2 Timothy, keep in mind that Paul is basically writing last comments to Timothy. In this one, he's writing to a young pastor who's dealing with people. Uh, years ago when I was ordained, Peter Lord came to my ordination and he did my ordination, led my ordination. And as he was talking, he had this really thick uh, accent. Uh, mm, ah, and he would uh, mm, ah, mm, laugh at his own jokes. Mm, ah, mm, ah, mm, ah. And he looked at me and he said, uh, Eric, you need to know something. Uh, uh, you're going to be shepherding sheep. And you need to know sheep bite. <laughs> and then he laughed at his own joke. <laughs> And I've never forgotten that. And the truth is, if you go to help anyone, and it's not just pastors, it's you too. No good deed goes unpunished, right? You go to help somebody, and here's the deal. So, so you, you know what you're supposed to do? You quit. Don't help anybody anymore. No, but, but there's something in us. See, the enemy wants you to quit and not help anyone and not be grateful for what you have. You know, a lot of times we're like the three-year-old that goes to Disney World. And I, I, I enjoy going to Disney World. I know some of you don't. You don't like to go. And my opinion of you is, so, <laughs> you don't go. But I love to go. It's one of the cheapest things you can do. And it's the only thing you can do for six hours with a teenager. <laughs> where they don't complain the whole time, right? But here's the deal with a three-year-old. And I heard a, a Christian comedian talk about this. And I thought it was great. He said, they took their three-year-old to Disney and they did the full thing where they spent all their money and they stayed in a Disney hotel. And so they show up Sunday night for the Disney hotel and they take the three-year-old to the pool and the three-year-old swimming in the pool and having a great time. And then the next day they go to Disney and they're in Disney and the three-year-old looks at the dad and there's you know Mickey Mouse walking around and it's a small world after all and, and Peter Pan and all this stuff and the dad's looking around and the three-year-old looks at him and goes, I want to go back to the pool. And here's the truth. The reason a three-year-old is like that is because a three-year-old can get focused on one thing and not notice everything else and get focused on, I just want that. One of the great things as kids get older is they figure out, oh, I'll have a good time now and then we can go and have a good time later. And the truth for many of us, if we're honest, is we're more like the three-year-old. Something in our life disappoints us. We don't get something we want. We maybe don't get something or things aren't going like we thought they went before or we like something in our past, but we don't like something in our present. And if we're not careful, we're like a three-year-old where we say, life was so much better when? Or it would be so much better if? And we spend our life walking through when and if instead of living in the now and being grateful, listen, for today. You ever really think about when Thanksgiving started? I mean, the pilgrims had lost a third of their families. And yet they were celebrating and being thankful. When Lincoln proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving, it was during the worst fighting in the history of our country. During the Civil War, he had lost children himself. He lived in the White House, which was literally a swamp back then. And yet he said, let's give a time of thanks to God for all he's done. So I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know who you're dealing with. I don't know who you're already thinking about Thanksgiving. Am I going to see so-and-so? 
Will they want to talk about politics? Will they want to talk about whatever? Oh, and you're already getting wound up before you even get there. And I want to encourage you to give thanks and to know you're not the only one who struggled with these things. As Paul talked to Timothy so many years ago, he challenged him about several things. But here's three things he challenged him with, and it's three things that we'll struggle with. Number one, don't let hypocrites distract you. The church is full of hypocrites. The pastorate is full of hypocrites. The gym is full of fat people. Okay? Hypocrite just means somebody who's wearing a mask, who's pretending to be something that they're not. So if you're a Christian and you're at least honest about, I'm messed up, I'm broken, I sometimes get focused on the wrong thing, I get aggravated, irritated, you should see me drive, right? If we're honest about those things, guess what we're doing? We're taking our mask off. It doesn't mean we have our act together. And it doesn't excuse how we act either. Don't do that either. But the truth is, we take our mask off and we go, hey, you're a real person, authentic and so Paul's dealing with this, and he says, the Spirit, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And what Paul was specifically talking to Timothy about was people who said, you've got to follow all the Jewish laws to be a good Christian. And Paul, who was Jewish, who did this growing up, said, those are things taught by demons. Basically, they're trying to make you legalistic. They're trying to tell you that you've got to do all these things. And then he continues, such teaching come through, listen, hypocritical liars. Why does he say that? Because these are people who love to tell you what to do, but they don't do it themselves. They love to tell you how to live, but they don't even try to do that. They try to tell you what you need to do and the way you need to do it, but they don't even make an attempt. That's a hypocritical liars. And then he continues, whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. And what Paul's saying is, not only are they hypocrites, they're hypocrites that don't care. They don't care about other people. I remember years ago, we had a Christian group, a, a Christian musical group that would come to our church in Miami every year. And Every year they would come, and I remember them coming because I was a young teenager and I loved music. And, and here were uh, 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 men and women who were in college, you know, and I'm like, ooh, and they were playing instruments and, 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 and singing, and it was upbeat and it was exciting. And I remember every year they would take an offering, and every year the head guy would talk about their bus being broken. And every year he would say they needed a new engine. And I remember thinking, he's got a terrible mechanic, apparently, and <laughs> needs a new mechanic or something. You know, I'm like, what is wrong? Well, years later, I, I knew and became friends with two people who were in that group for years. And they said, we had engine trouble at every church we ever went to. Engine trouble. Now, why would he lie to all those people? Because it helped him to get more money. Do you think that doesn't go on today? Hey, Jesus hasn't even been gone that long. And Paul's talking to one of the first young pastors in the early church and saying, there are hypocritical liars out there. My favorite story, my absolute favorite story, I remember there was another Christian group that would come to our church when I was a kid, and the guy would always tell this story about how one week he put his old Timex watch in the offering plate, and at the end of the service, it came back with a Rolex. And then he would show everybody the Rolex. And I remember, even as a young teen, going, I, I don't think that's how that story's supposed to go. And so the truth is, if you're around Christianity for very long, you're going to get around people that you're going to say, wow, they seem to really have their act together. And you're going to be sadly disappointed. 
I always tell people in my small group, you know, people join my small group. They're like, oh, Pastor Eric, he's so awesome. I got to join his group. And they join my group. And they come to group a couple weeks. They're like, oh, isn't that a great lesson from Pastor Eric? And then about four weeks later, they're saying, who made him the pastor of this church? We really need to get somebody who's a better Christian to be the, right? So over time, what happens? Everybody's messed up and everybody's broken. And here's the deal. Listen, if you focus on other people, you will never be thankful. Did you hear me? If you focus on the Christian walk of others to determine your Christian walk, that person that you admire is broken. The only one who got it all right's name is Jesus. Everybody else is just, is just trying to follow Jesus and stumbling along the way. And sometimes stepping in something, right? So the truth is, if you get your eyes on other people, you are not going to be grateful. You're not going to be thankful. Because you're going to be like, ah, I can't believe that person and what they did. And can you believe how they live? I mean, they say this and do that. And can you believe they blah, blah, blah. And when you start to do that, you become ungrateful and bitter and frustrated. And it's not new. You think it's something new. Like, we've never had this in history. First Timothy. First. Not second. First. Like, first letter to the dude. Like, first pastor letter. Dear Timothy, there's a bunch of jerks at your church. <laughs> Sorry, that was Eric's translation, but you know. But if you think that's also new, listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 23, 1 through 3. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That was them trying to be authoritative, trying to put themselves in a place where people would have to respect them. So you must be careful to do what they tell you. And then Jesus says this, listen. But do not do what they do. For they don't practice or do not practice what they preach. You think it's something new? That there's some TV preacher that you're like, I can't believe that TV preacher. Never in the history of the world has there been anybody. Jesus is saying it. He knew there would be people. Paul even said there's going to be people that preach the gospel to make money. Paul said that. And then Paul said, but I'm not going to focus on them. I'm not going to complain about them. If they're advancing the gospel, so be it. So you know that jerk pastor that you don't like that your friend calls you and says, I heard the best sermon by this shyster. <laughs> is that a bad word? I don't know if that's a bad word. I hope not. You have a choice at that point to go, I can't believe you're listening to them. Or to say, so tell me, what do they say from the Bible? And they may give you a verse and then go, wow, what they say is good. What they do is bad. But what they said was good, right? So don't let hypocrites distract you. There will always be them. By the way, if you want to see a hypocrite, sometimes all you have to do is look in the mirror, right? I mean, haven't you ever gotten up in the morning and thought, I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to be nice to that person at work. And I'm going to do... And then you see the person. Oh. <laughs> right? Number two. Give thanks always. I am one of the most spoiled flyers on earth. Tracy, it's me. I am the most spoiled. Let me tell you why I'm spoiled. It's my sister's fault. My sister for years worked for Delta, and when I was in seminary, I had to fly out to New Orleans 16 times for my master's degree, and then another five times for my doctorate degree, okay? Fly back and forth to New Orleans. My sister, because she worked for Delta, could get me on a plane, and so I would drive to Tampa. I would knew exactly what time the flight was. I would carry a carry-on bag only. I could run to the flight. And you ready for this? You ready for this? Write this down. First class almost every time. Almost every time. First class every time. Just get on the plane. Put my bag up. Yes, I'd like a soda, please. Home James, right? Or whatever. First class. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All the time. So 30 times first class. So now when I fly, the hardest thing, 
is when Southwest is $100 cheaper because it's a bus and you might get on. So typically, we try to fly Delta. My sister works for Delta, so we kind of have a little, little promo there. Tracy, if you're watching today, I expect a kickback. All right, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So Delta gets you there. So, so but, I, but, but, you know, you get these choices when you're choosing tickets. And you can choose, you know, you just want to sit anywhere, it's cheap. And I'm like, how much to pick a seat? 30 bucks to pick a seat. Okay, that's worth it. 30 bucks. Seat. Spoiled. I'm spoiled. So I try to get as close to the front. I can't afford first class. Are you crazy? So I get as close to the front as I can. They charge a little extra. I know where I'm going to sit. I know where it's going to be. I get all settled in. If things change a little bit, I get grumpy. I complain. Except for one time. One time we were flying to Utah. And the weather started moving up in Utah. And I remember they came and they said, your flight is canceled, but we can get you on this earlier flight, but there's hardly any seats left. We could fly you out tomorrow and give you the exact same seats. I said, but we could fly today? Yes, in like a few minutes. But the seats aren't good. Okay, okay. I'll never forget. They gave us our tickets. I didn't know a plane was that long. <laughs> we walked. Elise and Kristen and I, we're walking down the thing. I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm realizing I'm running out of numbers. We are in the three seats that do not recline in the back of the, next to the bathrooms and the galley. And I'm on the aisle where everybody walks by. Good to see you. Everybody would stand here and talk over my... They did, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. They're just talking. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I've never been so happy to be on a flight. Now, normally I'm picky. But I knew it was either get on this flight or don't go. And it was amazing how my perspective changed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's good to have all of you here. Thank you. <laughs> and normally, near the front, normally, where's my bag going? Normally, I'm the early, I'm the crazy early person at the airport that's there going, three hours is better than one. I'm a crazy person. You got a crazy, I see you pointing at the crazy people. Thank you. You're my people. You late people I don't get, yeah. And yet, here I was happy. What changed? You ready? You ready? My perspective. Listen, sometimes if we're honest, the reason that we're not grateful and the reason we're not thankful has nothing to do with the circumstance we're in. It has to do with how we're looking at it. So I'm suddenly sitting in the worst seats on the plane, but I'm glad to be flying. And so I'm thankful for the flight. Not the people. The flight. Some of you are in bad circumstances. I get it. Some of you are going through something you wish you weren't going through. You're dealing with something this Thanksgiving you wish you weren't dealing with. You're, you're in a struggle. You're in a place. You're in a frustration. You're in a situation that you don't want to be in. But I'm telling you, the seats on the plane are not the important part. You're flying. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is all just temporary anyway. Are you focused on the pool? Or do you realize where you're at today? I know it's not the best. I, I know that somebody else has it better. I know that other people aren't dealing with what you're dealing with, but guess what? You're in those seats. So you could be miserable the whole time. Or you can recognize that you're flying. Listen to what Paul says here. 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 6. And I love this because it's about eating. 
For everything God, you can read this one at the Thanksgiving table. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with Thanksgiving. Maybe sweet potatoes, that's up to you, I don't know. (laughs) Collard greens, I don't know. Right? Because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Now what Paul was talking about was meat sacrificed to idols. They, people had bale burgers and Paul was basically saying to them, don't worry about the bale burgers, you can eat them anyway, just be thankful that he gave them to you. And so he's saying, all things can, you can be thankful for. But I don't like where it came from. But be thankful anyway. I don't know if you have anything in life right now that you're not thankful for where it came from. But be thankful anyway. And then it continues. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truth of the faith and of the good teaching that you've followed. More focused on the gratitude than what they were eating. More focused on the thankfulness than what they were dealing with. I don't know what you're dealing with. But I promise you, you can be thankful in the middle of it. If I could be in a hospital room for 30 days and not knowing if I was going to walk out of the hospital room. And I still remember looking out the window and saying, God, thank you that I can see the sunset on those buildings. Then you can be thankful for whatever you're walking through today doesn't have to be good it's a struggle and by the way nothing i've ever done for jesus has ever been comfortable if you're not uncomfortable you're probably not being obedient to god there should be things in your life that are not comfortable when you're striving to do what god wants you to do it requires discomfort it means giving up your comfort 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, all this is for your benefit. Why? So that the grace that is reaching more and more people is going to do what? As grace is poured into you, it causes thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Do you have a thanksgiving memory? I remember going to grandma's house in Fort Mill, South Carolina, near Charlotte. Remember all the food on the table? I remember all those times. And I smile just thinking about those times. Just fun. Is there anything that makes you smile? I want to encourage you this year, this Thanksgiving week, go through the alphabet and just just walk through that alphabet and thank God for something that has to do with every letter. You can do people if you want. You have to know it as Xavier, but... Take some time this week and be thankful. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. Number three, develop character and use your gifts. When I used to surf, that's been a long time ago, but when I used to surf in college, I remember I would go surfing and I would come in and there'd always be some dude on the beach. And then I'd go back out and surf some more and I'd come back in and that dude's still sitting on the beach. You know what we call that dude? Poser. Because he didn't actually surf. He just sat there looking like he was looking for the perfect wave. If you wait for the perfect wave to surf, you will surf very little. If you wait for the perfect moment to serve somebody, to bless somebody, to use your gifts, you won't do it because there is no perfect time. Don't wait for the perfect wave to do what God's called you to do. Just do what God's called you to do. And as you do it, guess what? He's developing character in you. He's developing who you are. And you're using your gifts to bless someone else. There's never a perfect time. You're like, well, when we get past this, you're not going to get past that. Eric, yes, we will. Yeah, you'll be 94. Don't wait till you get past everything. Just start surfing. Start doing what God's called you to do. Start blessing people. Start going out of your way saying, God, use my gifts. But I don't know all my gifts. Use what you know. Look for a need around you. Paul says this to Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the believers. How? In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, preaching and teaching. Don't neglect your gift, which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. What was Paul saying to Timothy? There's some people who think you're not ready, but be an example to them anyway. And what did he tell him to do? Spend time in the Bible. 
If you want God to change you, come up with one habit. Start spending daily time in the Bible. Start spending daily time saying, God, would you speak to me through your word? And God will change you and transform you and use you. And he will purify your speech. I know some of you struggle with your speech. I, I work construction with my dad. I totally get it. But God can change that as you spend time in his word. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says this, So it is with you, since you're eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try excelling in those that do what? That build up the church. Listen, some of you are walking around in life going, but I want to go to the pool. But I want to go to the pool. Oh, I've heard that. Ah. We're like that with God. God, I don't like this. How about you look around and be thankful for what you do have? Instead of searching for what you don't have. Or maybe you had it before and you don't have it now. Well, give thanks that you got to swim. And then say, God, this is where you have me now. This is the physical challenge I have. This is the mental challenge I have. This is the family challenge I have. This is a relationship challenge. This is the work challenge I have. But God, you know what? I give you thanks anyway for the good, even in the middle of this hard day. Even in the middle of this hard season. I hope that this Thanksgiving, that you'll do that. But not only do that, look for ways to bless other people. Instead of thinking, what am I going to do about that one person that comes to my house? Start thinking, how can I bless that person? How can I go out of my way to make them feel loved? But Eric, you don't know them. How can I go out of my way to make them feel loved? And when you begin to change your attitude, you'll find that you've got the right spirit to deal with them too because you're looking to bless them not to put up with them i pray that happens to you this week let's close in prayer father thank you for this time thank you for your word your power your strength i thank you that you love us lord i pray if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you today that today would be the day they surrender to you Lord, I pray also for those who are struggling with being thankful. They're dealing with some hard things. Father, I don't want to lessen anything they're dealing with, but I pray even in the middle of their struggle that you would pour out your grace to help them to be thankful. We thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.